we put out a call on social media. You put out a what? A call on social media to all these people out here. To see oh, I saw that on yeah. Twitter. I yeah. wonder who put that out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So we'd have some questions prepared for you. Great. So tonight, we have Meredy Jackson, who has a question for you. Meredy, are you here? Do you want to stand and ask Ellen your question? Hello. Hi. So, <laughs> Alan, as an actor, what impact do you think that television can have in the public awareness of scientific issues, and how do you think that that can best be used to get issues across to the public? Well, first of all, if it weren't for MASH, I wouldn't be here. <laughs> <laughs> we, as a matter of fact, bringing that show up is, a, is an interesting uh, example that I, I realize as I say it. We, we learned in the first couple of weeks that we had to have a professional nurse on, on the set when we did the surgery because we were making these egregious mistakes. <laughs> We were going from one patient to another without changing our gloves. <laughs> I mean, the people we were operating on would have been dead within a few minutes. <laughs> so we had that. We had a, a, a doctor going over the scripts to make sure that everything was accurate. It, it, it doesn't always work that way. The, the role of an advisor to help keep you straight and keep you informed it usually works like this. The advisor says, you know, you really shouldn't do it that way. And the producer says, thanks, thanks for your advice. <laughs> <laughs> and like, that's it. I think it can have an effect in a subliminal way if you show, A, respect for science and avoid stereotypes like the, the mad scientist and show people solving problems in a rational way. It's, it's like what I'm always, I'm always um, annoyed with on a, on a detective show. They completely left behind the model of Sherlock Holmes who was a rational person mm -hmm. and picked up on clues. And now the, you can't have a detective show without the hero saying, I have a hunch about this. And the hunch is what solves it. The hunch is the beginning. First, then you got to test it out. So I think it. I think there's some value. But what do you think? Do you think? Well, how about you? You're you're, probably, you're more of an expert in this than I am. <laughs> it's it's that balance between drama, the drama, the needs of the storytelling, yeah. and the time it takes. You know, you think something like CSI. If we had to wait for those centrifuges to do their work, yeah. we. <laughs> We'd watch them, and <laughs> it wouldn't be so interesting. So it's the needs of the drama, I think, that overtakes it. Maybe that's what the producer's talking about. You, you know? know, but mm -hmm. one of the things we found, I don't mean but, I mean and. And. <laughs> one of the things we found was it takes more time to figure out how to marry the um, truth of the procedure, scientific truth, to marry that to the drama. Mm -hmm. But if you keep looking, you can see where the drama is in the truth, and you don't have to bend the truth. You don't have to leave the truth behind. Mm -hmm. that's, that's the opposite of saying thanks for your advice. That's, that's tell me more. Here's how we tell the story. Can you help us tell this story using the real facts? That takes, then, then you need to somehow get the people producing these shows to be to realize you get a better story if, if it's true. Mm. And then there's the human side. I think that's one of the things, just watching you today and the exercises in the classroom, it's, it's getting in touch with that human side. Yes. And I think sometimes the technology, for example, becomes a distraction to the human side of the inquiry and the rationality that you were talking about. Touching the human bit. Well, we'll probably get better communication between television shows and scientists, as scientists learn from your center and our center, how to humanize the scientists, the science for the benefit of the people without losing any accuracy. Mm. You know, like my doctor in Chile, he, he, he said it accurately, but he said it in a language I could understand. Mm. It, it's, it's really important that we not that I don't want anybody to think we're asking scientists to dumb down no. their science. 
accuracy. I don't think science was ever hurt by more accuracy. No, no absolutely, absolutely not. Thank you very much for that Thank question. You. My God, what a good one. Now, we also have, because it's International Women's Day, we have a fabulous question here right. from Bridie Moy. She has a question for you about women in science. Bridie, are you here? Hi, I'm a huge fan. Okay. <laughs> um, so, as an Australian Indigenous female who aspires to become a scientist, what advice would you give me to successfully communicate the importance of women in science? Well, be a terrific scientist and get the Nobel Prize. <laughs> <There you go. laughs> you know, it's interesting. I, you know, I, I wrote a play about Marie Curie, and I <clears throat> run in, 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 when I've seen it presented, I've run into a lot of people for whom Marie was a hero and a model. And the interesting thing is it wasn't only women who told me that. She was a model to many male scientists. She was a model to me while I was writing it because she's somebody who never gave up. And you're gonna never, you're gonna have to never give up too. You're gonna have to go through fiery hoops that men don't go through. They don't have to. There's a horrifying article in uh, this past Sunday's New York Times about mash notes that women scientists receive from colleagues or from mentors, which is really scary. People who can hold them back by not giving them a good recommendation. Letter, the first letter is often very similar. All these letters seem to you, you may have, you saw that I article. I saw that article. Hmm. The idea that the letters are typical. The first letter is, I have to tell you my feelings. Well, who asked him for his feelings? And then the feelings turn out to be uh, that he's obsessed with her and she's going to have to live with that. It's a horrifying position to be put in. What do, you, do you complain or what? And I think the writer advises her female scientist to complain right away. Straight away. Yeah. That's it. That may be a whole separate course you teach. I don't know. <laughs> I, think it, I think it might be. I think you know, it, one of the hurdles is the stereotype that all women have everywhere. Um, I talked with a scientist who did one of these studies where I think there's been more than one done, but she told me about her study where she sent out resumes as if this person was applying for a job. It was the same resume to every department. Half the resumes had a woman's name at the top and half had a male name. And the ones with the women's names were offered jobs less frequently, significantly less frequently, and when they were for less money. And when the question was asked, Can, do you think, judging by this resume, that this person is serious about science? Same resume, the women got judged less serious. They weren't, it wasn't the women, it was the women's names. So you, you, gotta, you gotta know that's coming and you have to be prepared to fight it. We all got to fight it. We mm. got to educate everybody about that. Mm. Indeed. The other side of that, of course, is that I was talking to Christine about this over the week, that sometimes women hold, them ba hold themselves back um, from sort of doing any kind of emotional language. You were talking about the immediacy of language and using yeah. emotive um, language to, to meet your audience. And, and sometimes women scientists really avoid that trend so that they're not called emotional, or they're not seen right. to be. And right. so you can kind of hold yeah. yourself back from those communication opportunities by giving in to that, that kind it's of fear one, of being emotional. That's one reason why I try to emphasize that we want to evoke emotion in the audience. We don't necessarily mean that you need to right. get emotional. There is this real problem that women scientists have told us about, that they don't want to lose authority. They're not, they, too often they come in because of the bias of the person listening, they come in with a perceived lower authority than they actually have. But if I think it's still possible, and we, and we talk about really developing techniques to make this clear and make it happen. I've seen plenty of women scientists 
who have total authority but are warm and available at the same time. The problem is when a man shows emotion, he gets praise for it. If a woman shows emotion, they say, well, she, you know, she, she must be having a problem. Mm -hmm. But you can be warm and authoritative mm -hmm. at the same time. And you mm -hmm. don't, that's why I always make that joke, you don't have to have a nervous breakdown. That's, right? Right. that's true for the men, too. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> Thank you, Bridie. Thank you Thank very you. much for that question. So, as part of our social media communication with everyone, we, we ran a little contest about what science experiment people would like to do with you. <laughs> <laughs> Did you come up with one? Well, we've, got, we've got a couple suggestions here. Um, quite a few people still like the Mentos in the Coke bottle. Now, Mentos are those menti, oh, yes, you, know, yes, you put those in the Coke yeah. bottle. Yeah, quite a few, few of you still like that. <laughs> um, a majority of the responders said that they would love to see you reconstruct the still from MASH. <laughs> That's funny. Um, we had a couple shout-outs for your story on Alex the parrot. Oh, yes. yes. Yeah. Um, you, know, you know, it was interesting, but you, you know, there was this parrot that was supposed to have uncanny human abilities to recognize things, recognize objects and things like that. So somebody had studied this parrot for about 20 years or more, and the parrot finally died. And because I had interviewed the parrot on television, I was mentioned in the parrot's obituary. <laughs> <laughs> it's the first time I'd ever had that honor. A Alex, was it? Yes. Yeah, Alex a very nice bird. <laughs> <laughs> Not like that cockatoo this morning. <laughs> what is that? How does that rank as a mating call? <laughs> <laughs> Do they get a lot of action with that? <laughs> they must, they must. So do, do you have a favorite science experiment, maybe one that you do with a grandkid or something you've wanted to do, a favorite, a favorite experiment? A favorite experiment mm -hmm. that I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. Well, actually, I funded an experiment. Yeah. Oh, I shouldn't talk about it because it'll go out over the media. Oh. It's going to be in my book, and I can't, can't, I'm still finishing up the book. So you'll read my book, you'll find out. <laughs> It's really fascinating. You're going to like it. It's a great experiment. Okay. All right. Moving along. <laughs> <laughs> got, got the pitch in. Um, okay. So Renee Hamilton has a question about science communication, a, a, a question near and dear to our heart. Renee, are you here? Yep. Great. Uh, hi, Alan. Where uh, are you? Here. Oh, hi. <laughs> um, what two or three events or issues do you see as our biggest failure in communicating science effectively? I missed half of that. Didn't you? So, what are, what are the big issues? What are the failures? What are the big issues oh, that make well, us fail I don't know at science if you have the same issue. Well, I know you have global uh, warming, climate change here as well as we do. Do you have this problem with vaccination here? Sadly, yes. It must be worldwide because it started in London, I think, and totally uh, disproved that, that, it, that it leads to uh, autism. Mm -hmm and yet it still hangs on. The people who, it's an interesting problem, the people who are telling the story that there's a problem with it have a more vivid story to tell. It registers in your mind, you can see their child, you can see their emotion. My kid, they'll say, was fine until the vaccination. It's a real story. The story that it's been disproven by research is not as vivid a story. I think it can be made vivid mm -hmm. if we go to your center and my center. <laughs> Indeed, <laughs> I like that, I like that. But uh, that's a re that, that, those are two examples that of possibly communication. Now, interestingly, communication doesn't necessarily mean more information. It means more how the information is conveyed. 
because I've read about, and I can't tell you, you may know more about this, I've read about this vaccination problem not getting better when people get more information. They sometimes dig in their heels in the face of information and say, no, I, I know what, what the real story is. Mm -hmm. So there's, and that's really what's at the heart of what we do, I think. It's not just spraying information at people, it's getting in touch with them in a way so that you reach them. I, I, while, while Christine O'Connell from our center, the associate director of our center, was doing her workshop today, I was hoping I wasn't inter interfering with your workshop because I was writing down things she was saying because I had never heard her say this before. She said, writing a paper isn't communication, it's getting them to understand it, reaching them with it, getting into the other person's head, that's communication, rather than what I am always complaining about, which is spraying information at them. You know? mm -hmm. What do you think are the, the big issues that are? Well, I mean, along those lines, I mean, one of the biggest issues, of course, is trust. And if you start from the position that um, scientists don't want to communicate, or researchers um, are, are, are sort of uh, in a different position from the audience, right? That radical kind of thing where scientists can't communicate, the public doesn't want to know. If you start with that expectation, I don't think your communication future is probably very bright. And so those trust issues, those social trust issues, yeah. I think are very important. Um, I also, you know, you touched on risk. Um, what? Risk, you touched on risk as an important issue. And you know, when, once um, a risk is identified, it's very difficult to kind of work around that. Yeah. So if people think that they're putting their children at risk, for example, in the vaccination case, yeah. that's, a very, that's a big barrier to communicate around. <clears throat> there's, an, there's another interesting issue of um, modified, genetically modified <clears throat> food. Mm. <clears throat> From what I read as, as a total layperson, I get the impression that there are concerns about that, of if you plant a field of something, are you sure it's not going to get to another field? Mm -hmm. But eating food that's been genetically modified, it seems to me that there's, there's no evidence whatsoever that it's going to do it. But in fact, as we always hear from the people who know, we've all been eating genetically modified food for centuries. Sure. It just hasn't been done in a test tube, but it's been done. Mm. In, the, in the farm. Mm. But what about, so, what, so my, my question, I'd like to hear mm -hmm. your, your feeling about it. My, my, my feeling is it's an interesting subject because there may be questions that it's appropriate to ask. I want to hear the pu public posing the appropriate questions that, are, that do represent real risk. I want to see the public involved in raising questions that science has to listen to and respond to. It really should be a two-way street because they're going to be using the science. So they, they, need, they need to be asking questions about do cell phones cause cancer, but they need to be listening to answers that they can trust. Absolutely, but you, you know, one of, the, one of the things that puzzles me a bit is the limited number of forums that that can happen in. Yeah. Uh, I mean, so, you know, um, that we talk about long-form journalism. You mm. mentioned the New York Times or the New Yorker here in um, Australia. We have a, a number of outlets. Cosmos is a science um, magazine, a popular science magazine. But as, as those um, are fairly rare beasts, yeah. it's, it's very difficult to see where the forums are where, where people can ask those legitimate questions and get the answers and even follow up. Yeah, and that now it's reached the point where in a five second thing on the news, they say new breakthrough, cancer will be over next week. Yeah. <laughs> Great. And, and yeah. it, it's so rushed and so um, inadequate, so thin. Yeah, I just remembered another thing, which I then, another thing that's, oh, you know what I think is a real problem? That, we, that more communication will remedy mm. is that the public doesn't think like scientists enough. They don't ask for evidence. They don't demand evidence. They say, you know what I heard? And they hear it from a neighbor often. Mm -hmm. And that's good enough for a lot of people. 
One of the things I think good communication on the part of scientists will do is without even, without even making a big deal out of it, will accustom the public to th look for evidence, to think, to, to think rationally, evidence-based decision-making. That kind of thing is really lacking. Mm. And we, we make poor decisions. We go to war. We went to war with no evidence. Yeah, we did. Wow. So, Alan, no, today we did a very interesting exercise with uh, you Wait, and Christine. Didn't say that again. We did an interesting exercise today with you and Christine, one of your improv treatments. And I wondered if we could do a mass improv experiment. Okay, which one do you have in mind? I think we should throw a ball. Oh, sure, okay. Okay. And can, okay. We, can we throw it to the audience? Now, I'm, I'm, we, we, we're <laughs> just going to make it one ball. We'll show you how with the ball here. Let's get off the okay, thing so yeah. we don't we're hurt, hurt ourselves. Yes. Yeah. Here, this mm -hmm. is a beach ball. It's a beach ball, okay. Now throw it back to me. Okay, I throw it back to you first. <laughs> so the idea is the ball exists because we agree on the shape and the weight. So it should take the same amount of time to go through the air as a real beach ball, and it shouldn't change size. Okay, pass it around the audience. Oh, good. Stand up. Pass it around. Here it comes. Oh, nice one. Whoa, look at that. We got beach balls everywhere. <laughs> it turned into 17 beach balls. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Are we done? Yeah. Thank you. That was great. Thank you all for coming. Good night. Ladies and gentlemen, thank Alan Alda. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.